Let's just jump right into this. We started a new series last week called Masks, and we're talking about how that we have a tendency to hide behind masks. And the Bible's very clear that if we cover our sin, that we will not prosper. The Bible says in order to be healed, you confess your sins one to another. And I think that that really talks about how that you can be uh, spiritually and emotionally healed by being able to share with others and take off the mask. And that's why we talk about here at this church that we don't want to wear the Sunday face when we come to church. Now, we don't want to be guilty of too much information, all right? I've had members of our church that have done this many times, and they tell me about their hemorrhoids, or they tell me about something of that nature, and I'm like, let's just not go there, okay? Um, but being able to, um, to be able to get this off your chest, so to speak, to be able to share your burdens with each other is a very important thing. So we're talking about masks. Last week we talked about the mask of fear. And today we're going to talk about something that's actually related to it, the mask of anxiety. The mask of anxiety. Now, what is anxiety? It is the intense, excessive, and persistent worry and fear about everyday situations. Let me just kind of give you an example between the difference between fear and anxiety. Fear is if a spider jumps on you, okay? Now, not everybody's afraid of spiders, but if you're like I am, you don't want an arachnid on you. you. You don't want anything to do with them. I don't know why God made them. I'm sure he has his reasons, but if I had my choice, all of them, all of them, all of them would be dead, okay? Especially those big old gigantic ones, all right? I don't like those. They're a little bitty tiny one I can deal with, but that is a fear, okay? You know, you get something on you, that's a, f- a fear. Anxiety is, if you live in a part of the country where you found a tarantula in your bed, and every day of your life you can't go anywhere, you can't get in the bed without pulling the covers back, searching, you worry constantly about spiders, that's anxiety, okay? Um, when I was a young man, I was a youth pastor. Many of you know my story. Went into ministry full-time at age 17. Started traveling when I was in Bible college. Kim and I were in 400 churches together while we were in college ministering to churches. And uh, just a wonderful time. Um, When I was 21, I became a youth pastor. And one of my favorite things to do when I was a youth pastor for 10 years was to do Halloween activities. And the reason I did that was I love scaring these kids, loved it. And I use the word love, okay? Because yes, it was a godly, deep love that I loved, especially to scare high school boys. That was like a passion of mine. And we would do all kinds of stuff. We'd have haunted houses, we'd have haunted trails. And I remember one time we had this haunted trail and we would not let the kids go in large groups. Scarier if you're in groups of two to four, all right? so. They're walking through the woods, there's no light, and we're jumping out and scaring them, doing all kinds of crazy things. But one thing that I would do is I I would see these kids coming, I knew they were coming, and there was this bush that I could hide in right beside the trail, and as they're walking along and the boys are like, you know, this ain't scary, you know, I'm not afraid, and would grab a hold of their ankle and scream at the top of my, my lungs, okay? And uh, so, obviously, that was very effective. There were these big football players, and they, I, I heard them. They were like, this ain't scary. I ain't afraid of nothing. And I reached out and grabbed both of their ankles. They were with their girlfriends, and they went screaming through the woods like two little girls. And their girlfriends were left standing there, and I just popped up and said, hey, girls, how are y'all doing? And they're like, hey, Pastor Richie, how are you doing? Our boyfriends just ran through the woods screaming. Now, there's a difference between fear and anxiety. You you get what I'm talking about? Today, I'm going to read a story uh, from the New Testament about the life of Jesus when he healed a blind man. 
And you're going to see in this story that this man had a lot of anxiety, and Jesus showed him how to deal with it. Luke chapter 18, verses 35 to 43. And as he drew near to Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. And hearing a crowd go by, he inquired what this meant. And they told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And he cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And those who were in front rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and commanded him to be brought to him. And when he came near, he asked him, what do you want me to do for you? And he said, Lord, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, recover your sight. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. Now, I don't know what your anxieties are. It's quite possible you have anxiety from your work or from your family or from your health. There are many reasons that we have anxiety. But I want to show you from Scripture, from this passage of Scripture, how we can deal with the anxieties, how you can conquer your anxieties in life. And and last week, the first thing we started off with is the same thing we're going to start off with this week. You've got to acknowledge your problem. Until you admit your fear or until you admit your anxiety or that you've got a problem or that you are struggling in an area, you will never be able to get better. That's the first thing. In fact, that's the first thing uh, in any part of our relationship with God. Do you remember when Jesus gave the Sermon on the Mount? You've heard of the Beatitudes, right? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And he goes on and talks about how blessed we are when we do certain things. The idea there, blessed are the poor in spirit, that word poor uh, is a word that means abject helplessness, completely broken, unable to do anything for yourself. Unless someone helps you, you cannot be helped. And God says this, Jesus said this, the way to begin a relationship with God, which is what the Beatitudes are about, The way that you can be in relationship with God and be blessed is by admitting that you can't do it by yourself. That is the story of the gospel. We must build our lives around the gospel. We must build our lives around this idea that we can't do it alone. Now, I realize that goes against the American way. I realize that goes against many people that are pull yourself up by your own bootstraps kind of people. And I'm that kind of person. I've always been that way. But when it comes to our relationship with God, we cannot do it on our own. No matter how hard you try, no matter how many churches you're a member of, no matter how much you read the Bible, no matter how much you give, no matter how many good things you do, you do not get into a right standing with God through your own effort. It is through the right relationship that comes from being in relationship with Jesus Christ. And the only way that you can begin this relationship is to admit that you can't do it by yourself. That's why the Bible says that all have sinned. All fall short of the glory of God. You're not perfect. You can't do it on your own. It's not enough that you put forth effort. The fact is you must acknowledge your problem. And we're talking about salvation, but also in the same way, anxiety. Did you know it's okay to admit that you have struggles with anxiety? Did you know it's okay to admit that you have struggles with fear? I know often for men especially, we don't want to admit anything that might make us look weak. We don't want to admit that we have any fear. But I must tell you, and I've told you this story before, uh, a year or so after we started this church, I broke down. I was driving up uh, north on I-75, and I suddenly began to weep uncontrollably. I had to pull over. I couldn't see. I was weeping so hard. Pulled over on the side of the road and wept for probably 30 minutes to 45 minutes. I have no idea why. It wasn't like I was thinking about something that made me sad, but I was under such pressure 
And most of that pressure came from myself. And I had to tell the Lord, God, I can't do this anymore. And what I was telling God was, he had to take this thing and not me. And, you know, and I knew theologically that Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. But I wasn't acting that way. I was acting like Richie is the one that's responsible for everything. Now, am I responsible to lead? Yes. But you know what? God is the one that he says, take your burdens to him because he cares for you. And so until you begin to admit it, you can never overcome it. In the same way with this blind man. Um, Did you know that in his day, uh, being blind was almost a death sentence? That's not in our culture today. Um, You know, if you have eye problems, you can have surgery or you can get glasses or you can get contacts. Or there are many other things that you can do. And I know some people have degenerative, um, you know, diseases with the eyes, but you can have help. In Jesus' day, here's what would happen to a blind person. Someone would show up at your house in the morning, maybe a loved one, maybe a family member, and they would march you to this place where it was public, and you would put down a little blanket, uh, a little pallet, and you would sit there and you would beg all day. If you did not, you'd starve to death. If you did not, you weren't going to be able to make it. You weren't going to be able to live. And and I realized that was different than the culture that we live in now. But the fact is, this man had to admit his problem. And you and I, if we're going to overcome anxiety, we've got to readily admit our problem. Now, I want you to notice something about what this man did. He admitted his problem, but he didn't elevate it. There are a lot of people that admit their problem, but they elevate the problem to a status that it does not deserve. Your problem is not God. Let me say that again. Your problem is not God. Now, you're about to catch on. Somebody got it, okay? I'm going to give you one more shot, all right? If not, I'm going to go sit on the front row and amen myself, all right? So... Let me say this again because this is worth the price of admission today. Your problem is not God. Yeah. Now, understand this. What happens to us many times is we elevate the problem. Yeah, we've got to see the problem. We've got to acknowledge it. But you've got to see that there is a Savior that is greater than your problem. And that's what this man, when he spoke to Jesus, was he still blind? Yes. He admitted his problem, but he didn't elevate the problem because he went to Jesus with it. Now, let let me just point out a couple things that he had problems with. He had people problems. Did you notice in the story like I did that he began to yell for Jesus and people said, shh, be quiet. You're embarrassing yourself. You're making too much noise. You're making people uncomfortable. You ought not to do that. Anybody ever had somebody tell you something you ought not to do? Anybody ever had somebody that didn't support you? Now, once again, I'm not talking about if you're doing uh, silly things or things you shouldn't be doing. Sometimes I find that people just simply want somebody to uh, identify with them or to agree with them when they're doing something wrong. That's not what we're talking about. Here's a man that had a solution to his problem, and people said, that won't work be quiet. You're making too much noise, and I can promise you this. You seek Jesus. You seek a relationship with God. There's going to be somebody to try to discourage you. You're just spending way too much time down there at that church. Do you really think that you should give like what they're saying down there? They're just wasting that money. You know that as well as I. What do they do with that anyway? And look, no matter what it is, you know, and let me just say this. People are okay with just a little bit of religion. In fact, the devil is okay with you having a little bit of religion. The Bible says that the devil, uh, you know, he knows God and he's afraid, okay? He admits that there's a God. The devil, and, and I really believe this, he does not come to you dressed up in a red suit and a 
long tail and a pitchfork and horns, okay? He's much subtler than that, okay? And he's not going to tell you, don't ever make a decision for God. Because he knows that if he came and tried to tell you that, you would resist him. You'd be like, oh, no, that's not right. But you know what he will do? He'll say, do it later. Not right now. I mean, after all, you've got so much going on. The calendar's so full. There's some things you need to do. Don't do it now. Just wait. And many Christians' lives are sacrificed on the altar of procrastination. And they don't even realize it. Well, he had people problems. What people expected, what they said. There are always going to be people that expect something different from you. And you got to learn to put on your big boy pants and stand up in faith and do what God tells you to do. That's what you got to do. You got to be willing to do that, okay? Um, he also had perspective problems. Now, you say, where do you get that from? Well, remember when he heard the noise of the big crowd coming by? He said, they said, who is this? He said, it's Jesus of Nazareth. He said, what does this mean? Now, maybe a rhetorical question, I don't know, maybe a philosophical question. But I do know what it means when Jesus comes by. When you follow him, when you turn to him, what does it mean when Jesus comes by? Well, I'll tell you what it means. It means that your life can be changed forever. It means that you can go to heaven when you die. It means you can have a relationship with God. What does it mean when Jesus comes by you? Maybe it means you can turn all your worries and your cares to him because he cares for you. This man, um, he addressed his problem. And until you address it, you're never going to get better. And let me tell you what it requires. It requires what the Bible calls repentance. Now, for too long, too many pastors have poorly defined what repentance is. Now, these are uh, aspects of repentance. When I was growing up, when I heard the word repentance, what I thought of was an old gray-haired preacher with a long bony finger and a big old family Bible and spittle coming out of his mouth when he talked and veins sticking out of his neck and his eyes bulging out and saying things like, you're better turn or burn, brother. Anybody ever know what I'm talking about? Now, there certainly are aspects of repentance that require us to turn around. But you know what repentance actually means? We're talking about biblical repentance. It means to change your thinking. It means to change your mind. It means to agree with God. It is that I'm walking this way, and God says, no, you need to walk this way. You go, oh, okay, I'm going to agree with God. I'm going to go that way. And when you understand repentance for what it truly is, you realize it's one of the greatest blessings God could ever give us. I can agree with God about things, okay? So we've got to, to learn to do that. Here's the second thing. After you admit your problem, you've got to activate your faith. You see, he could have just sat there, but he didn't. He activated his faith. His recovery began with faith. How do we know that? Well, he believed Jesus could heal him. He believed that God could do what he could not. He acknowledged Jesus as God, by the way. He said, son of David. That was the way the Jewish people in that time acknowledged the Messiah, the son of David. So this blind man, yeah, he had a problem. And yeah, he admitted it. And he didn't elevate it. But he did admit it, and then he said, you know what? I'm going to have faith in God. And he called Jesus the Son of God. He believed that God had great mercy. I was reading through the Psalms this week, and one thing that kept sticking out to me that just I kept seeing over and over and over again in the Psalms, that his mercy endures forever. His mercy is great. It just keeps on and on and on. So what am I saying? 
you need to believe that God can have mercy on you because he is a God of mercy. You say, well, what if he says no? Well, you shouldn't stop asking. Maybe he will hear your prayer. Ask God for mercy. Uh, And then Jesus, I love this, he asked a great question. Now, when you first read this, you're like, come on now, Jesus. Can't you ask a better question than that? Because here is a blind man shouting, hey, have mercy on me, Messiah, son of David. Jesus, everybody gathered around. He gets this man in front of him. He says, "Uh, so, what do you want me to do? Now, doesn't that seem pretty obvious what he wanted him to do? I mean, he's blind. He's calling out for the son of God. And Jesus looks at this blind man and says, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do for you? Now, the reason that is very important is because when you and I get asked that question, and God will ask you that question, sometimes we don't have the right answer. Jesus is like, what do you want me to do for you? What is it that you want? And you know, sometimes in our lives, we have the wrong response. Well, what I want is a million dollars, or what I want is, you know, a slim waist, or what I want is fewer wrinkles, or what I want is less gray hair, or hair, or whatever, you know. So, um, but the, the truth is, what you and I have to acknowledge is that it requires faith to respond to that question. What do you want me to do? And we need to respond in faith. That's what this man did. Um, He said, I want you to think about your situation. Now, here's what I've learned. God is a God of reason. Okay, I'm not suggesting that everything um, is reason or enlightenment with God. What I'm saying is God does not expect you to check your faith at the door. When you become a follower of Jesus Christ... Um, you are to exercise your faith. But you know what the Bible says in Hebrews chapter uh, 11? Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Now, those two words, it's evidence and substance. If your faith doesn't have those two things, you don't have a very good faith. God gives us evidence. Can I prove that there's a God? No, but I mock literally in my mind. I try not to do it uh, face to face. People that say there is no God. First of all, that is an arrogant statement. That's saying that you know everything in the universe. Uh, But secondly, uh, many people that claim to be atheists are people that say, well, we just believe in evidence. There is so much more evidence that there's a God and that he's alive and that he loves you and that he wants to work in your life than there is anything else in this world. You follow the evidence, okay? God cares for you. And then it's the substance and the evidence. Your faith should have substance to it. And the Bible tells us in the book of Isaiah, Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Now, there's a very important part of that verse that I believe God wants you to think about. Come, let us reason together. If you never reason about your faith, if you never think about your faith, if you never think about the good things of God and what he's done, the evidence that God is on your side, that God loves you, that God has a plan for your life, look, the devil tries to show you false evidence. Oh, look over here. Uh, You're having problems. God must not love you. Remember last week we read out of Psalm 3? David said, many are saying to me, there's no hope for him in God. And then he said, Selah, what do you think about that? Well, if I'd been there, I'd been like, I think they're stupid. That's what I think, you know, because God has a plan for you and he loves you. Okay, come now, let us reason together. 
And by the way, that's tied to repentance. Because what God wants you to do in thinking about his goodness and his grace and his love and his mercy is he wants you to change your thinking. He wants you to repent and to follow him. And in doing that, God changes everything. Because there is no life change until you agree with God, until you change your thinking. So when Jesus asked this man, what do you want? Jesus was more, he was interested in more than just restoring his sight. He was interested in his heart. And God is interested in that for you as well. Here's the third and final thing. Um, If you're going to overcome your anxiety, gotta admit the problem, gotta activate your faith. And then this is an interesting one. Number three, you gotta allow God to use you. Now, this man had been blind. We don't know how long, but he said, restore my sight. So we can assume that he had sight before. And the fact is, God used him because people ask him. Let let, let me read that passage again. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. You know what that tells me? That man let God use him. That man let God use his story. That man was able to tell others, I was blind, but now I see. I was blind, but Jesus came. This was my life before Jesus. This is my life after Jesus. You see, you've got to allow God to use you and your story Even your anxiety. Did you know that the things that we think show weakness in our life actually endear us to other people? Because there are people that think, well, a Christian and a church, well, they're all perfect. And I can't go there because I've got problems. But when you let them know, hey, you know what? I've got fear. I've got anxiety. I've got problems. All of a sudden, they're like, oh, well, you're kind of like me. And maybe there is hope for me. If there's hope for you, maybe there's hope for me. And so God uses that, and he wants to use you. What he did is he allowed his lifestyle to change. By the way, that's important for followers of Jesus too, isn't it? Allowing the lifestyle to change. The truth is, um, if there is no change in your life, your attitude, your outlook, then you're not going to be a good witness for Jesus. He followed Jesus, he praised God, and he influenced others. Now, what could this man have done? I want you to think about this. What could he have done? Well, he could have made excuses. Well, I'm blind. These are the circumstances. Um, He could have said, well, I don't have time for that. He could have said, this is too hard. He could have said, I'm just simply not good enough. He could have said, I'll, I'll do it later. He could have said, this won't work. He could have said, I can't afford this. Uh, these are all excuses that we offer in our personal lives when it comes to making a decision for Jesus. He, he could have wallowed in pity. There are a lot of people that do that. And I, I really want you to understand that as a follower of Jesus Christ, you are not a victim. You are a victor. Okay? And I realize in our culture today, there's a lot of profit for some people in keeping people as victims. I'm not a fan of that, just to be honest. Because you can say, well, you know, I've been taken advantage of by some people. Well, you and how many billion others, all right? So the truth is, that's happened throughout history, okay? You're not the only one that's ever been taken advantage of. You're not the only one that's ever been treated unfairly. But with Jesus, you are not a victim. God says that you are more than a conqueror through him. He could have blamed his circumstances, but thank God he acted in his faith. And God blessed him. I just want to close with some principles that we find in this passage, okay? And maybe they'll help you. There's the principle of urgency Luke 9, 62 from the message says this. Jesus said, 
no procrastination, no backward looks. You can't put off God's kingdom till tomorrow. Seize the day. You know what that means? You need to do it now. You need to stop waiting. You need to take your next step now. That's the principle of urgency. Um, Then there's the principle of perseverance. Sometimes the first time you try something, it doesn't seem like it's going to work. So don't quit. By the way, do you know that is an active work of the Holy Spirit in your life to create perseverance? Maybe you're not a real determined person. Maybe you're the kind of person that's like, you know, one try, you want to throw in the towel. But you know that the Bible talks about that the fruit of the Spirit, one of the fruits of the Spirit is faithfulness or perseverance. Just keep on getting up. In Proverbs, it says it this way, a righteous man falleth seven times and riseth yet again. So perseverance, there's the principle of declaration. And that is announcing your faith. This man announced his faith to let other people know. Don't be afraid to declare it. Then there's the principle of initiative. You gotta take the next step. And until you're willing to take that next step, you're not gonna get the results you're looking for. Jesus asked him, he said, what do you want? He said, I want to see. I want you to give me my sight. And God gave it to him because he did not wait. He took the initiative. And I hope you'll take advantage in the same way. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, help us today to follow you with all of our heart. Help us to have this perseverance, to have this faith, to follow you. God, I pray that you'd help all of our people to grow in their faith because of what we've learned from Scripture today. Now, before I finish my prayer, let me just ask, is there someone here today that would like to receive Jesus as your Savior? Just keep your heads bowed for a moment, if you would. Maybe there's someone online that would say, Pastor Richie, I need Jesus as my Savior. I would encourage you to pray something like this to God. I believe Jesus is the Son of God, that he died on the cross and rose from the grave. I don't understand everything about the Bible or even everything about salvation, but I'm asking you to come into my life. I'm committing my life to you now. I'm asking you to save me now. You know what God said he would do if you asked that? He said he would answer your prayer. For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd help anyone in the room today or watching online that needs to receive Christ, that today would be the day they do it. I pray for every person that's dealing with anxiety, God, that you'd help us, all of us, Lord, no matter who we are, that we would turn this over to you by faith. We would admit it. We would um, begin to uh, activate our faith, and then we'd help other people as well. And Father, we want you to know that we love you today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Before we're done today, let me just say, first of all, thank you for coming. Uh, Let me remind you of a couple things. We talk about next steps here. We say that your next step is your most important step. What is your next step? Maybe you need to go through the next step class. That's two weeks from today. 1030, just show up at regular time. We'll show you where to go. Uh, or maybe you want to be baptized, or you know someone who does want to be baptized. We're doing that next Sunday during the service, okay? So get ready for that. Or maybe you want to just take a next step by being involved. One way you can do that, bring candy for the kids uh, on the last Sunday of the month, and it's going to be great. Now, let me say this. If you uh, don't want your kids to have candy, that's okay. That's your prerogative. They'll probably be a lot healthier and you'll probably be able to go home and take a nap, whereas everybody else won't, all right? So, but that's okay. Your kids, there'll still be activities for them to do. They don't have to have candy, okay, if that's something that you don't want them to have, okay? So that's your choice. We acknowledge that. But we do want them to be involved. It's going to be a great day, and so I encourage you to make sure that they're here on the 29th, okay? All right. Thank you so much for coming today.